Good day, everyone. I am so excited um, that this session of the Friends of Multilateralism cycle of special dedicated sessions is going to be with Professor Petros Mavroidis and myself. Let me just briefly introduce Professor Petros Mavroidis. Probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but in any case, he's the Edwin, Edwin Parker Professor of Foreign and Comparative Law at Columbia Law School, also a member of the Legal Affairs Division from 92 to 95. And I think you're still currently a legal advisor to the WTO uh, under the, the services offered to developing countries, and you've been doing that since 1996? Yep. Excellent. So my accolades are much shorter. Um, I'm Jani Vremi. I am a director at the Sridhar Ramphal Center for Trade, Policy, and Law at the University of the West Indies. And I come to this more as an outsider. I used to work at the WTO's then appellate body, for six years and then worked um, in a law firm in Geneva and Washington for six years. But ever since 2000 and around 18, I've been more of an outsider. So um, I'm from St. Lucia, the Caribbean. So I come to this with a very, very special perspective, an insider, but also now an outsider. Petros, in what capacity are you going to comment on the, the reform proposals that we're going to look at for the next half hour? I have only one capacity. I am a total <laughs> outsider. <laughs> well, my affiliation with the WTO is to be totally independent. So what we do is the WTO has hired a couple of people to help developing countries when they have disputes, but we don't, we're not members of the Secretariat. Excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Petrus and I have not prepped at all for this session, so it's really going to be spontaneous. And what I plan to do for the next 25 minutes with Petrus is really go through this uh, newest of reform proposals that emerged from secret about 10 days before the MC13 meeting started in Abu Dhabi late last month, February. Um, and for many of us who were outsiders and not part of the negotiations, it was really, really well anticipated. Um, and we didn't even know, right, Petros, if it was going to be, when it was going to be released. At least I didn't know um, I when it was going to be released. So it was quite a surprise. Exactly. I think it was one of those surprise things that emerged. We didn't know it was coming and we certainly weren't expecting it to be 47 or 43 pages long, right? <laughs> that was the other surprise. All right. So we're going to dig into it. How I propose to interview you is start with the process to Abu Dhabi. What were we expecting to see? What was the process for the compilation of this decision. It's now a ministerial decision coming out of Abu Dhabi. Then I'm going to ask you, what are your, the things that surprise you? What are the things you think will work? What are the things that won't work? Um, and then in the last segment, maybe the five minutes before the end, I'd like to ask you what you think is the next steps for this uh, decision, this dispute settlement reform. Does that work for you? Perfect. Excellent. So let's go to the first set of questions. This is the process leading up to this decision. And I have it in front of me. The decision actually came out um, in the, on the 14th of February. And now it's been incorporated in as one of the decisions of Abu Dhabi on the 1st or the 2nd of March. And it was really well awaited because we know that dispute settlement reform has been on the agenda. It was one of the mandates coming from MC12, the previous ministerial conference, to conduct discussions with a view to having a full and well-functioning dispute settlement accessible to all members by 2024. Um, now, it seems as if on the one hand, it they failed because it, the decision Decision was not incorporated as yet. Coming out of MC13, we know that they were asked to continue working on it and members were asked to come up with solutions um, and continue the process. Um, but I think um, it was quite 
anticipated because we know the appellate body, for instance, has been non-functional since about 2019. Um, and that was one of the major areas. But in the process, I think the participants also decided that they wanted to have some tweaks with the current system. So over to you, uh, Petrus. Uh, tell me what for you was the big surprise coming out of this uh, decision um, incorporating all of these proposals? Well, I mean, to me, the only surprise was that there was a text, uh, quite frankly. I I don't think, I mean, I wouldn't even call it a decision. I think it is a euphemism. You have some sort of open-ended commitment. We should wrap up by the end of 24. And if not, nothing will happen. And quite frankly, I don't think it is, you can never predict the future. And I've been wrong a number of times in the past. But I don't think realistically you can expect anything by the end of 24. I I cannot see how, it de- first of all, it depends largely on the U.S. elections, which is November. And then there is very little time to wrap up between November and December if the right guys come to power and they want to change the W, they want to move ahead on the WTO. So uh, honestly, uh, overall, I'm not uh, I'm not that optimistic about it. I don't think uh, we should expect anything uh, game change uh, in the next uh, ten months, nine months. Okay, wow. So that at least with respect to the timeline, you're not optimistic that we're not going to no. get the end of 2024. No. But let's let's turn to the content of the proposals. So as I mentioned, um, if you read the the meeting notes that came out in on the 16th of February about the process, clearly the uh, negotiators in Geneva have been doing a lot of work over the last year on this. And we know it was led by the representative, then representative of Guatemala, Mr. Marco Molina, who presented quite a lot of history of how the process has been uh, executed. And one of the things that really struck me is that he said it was solution-oriented, interest-based, and (laughs) bottom-up. It seemed to have really come from a groundswell of uh, perspectives from the membership. Um, And then when you look at the actual text, it's really set up in a very interesting way. So there are titles and chapters 10 titles, chapters, and then appendices within each of these titles, one to 10, focusing on voluntary use of uh, alternative dispute resolution procedures, streamlining the process of the panel, qualified, looking at adjudicators, compliance with rulings and recommendations, uh, what I call member control, so review and operation of the system and a new accountability mechanism. But what's empty is the appellate review section. So let's put that aside for a little while. Let's focus a little bit on what's in the other titles. Anything in there that I mentioned that really strikes you as something new or worth some discussion, Petros? I I, first of all, I have to congratulate uh, Dr. Molina to head to Heather because it's clear that he did a lot of work. I mean, uh, to me, this is he defied expectations by coming up with a text. Uh, it's remarkable that they came up with a text, even if the text is not my first best test, whatever whatever my opinion is worth. It's remarkable that he came up with a text. Yeah. I think. There is one very positive point. I mean, it's not for, in my view, it shouldn't be a consistent feature, but for now, it makes perfect sense to place, uh, to find the right balance between deliberation and adjudication. And I think this this text does that in the sense that um, it rebalances a little bit this... uh, uh, crazy judicialization that we went through all those years. Every, If you go back to history, I remember I spoke to a number of people who were negotiating the DSU. They, all of them thought of the Apple at Bud as an exceptional, uh, let's say, occurrence. We'll go there if need be and so on. Nobody said certiorari, but more or less that's what they had in mind. This will happen once in a blue moon when need be. And the Apple at Bud ended up being your second instance, the second step, 
in almost all cases over time. So now right. this tries to rebalance this a little bit, and I think and I think it's a, the correct thing to do, especially now that we go through crisis. And through crisis, we need to persuade more than when we're not in crisis. So I, I appreciate that very much. Uh, there are some omissions in my view, and important omissions. I'm not blaming anyone. Don't misunderstand me. I'm saying uh, what would be my ideal text. I Central, would just spend, before yeah. you before you go into what is missing, can I just um, detain you a little bit on how you think that balance is achieved? So from my perspective, although it's still a, a sort of a dispute resolution type mechanism, the expansion in Title I of all of the procedures for good offices, conciliation, mediation, and arbitration, but also these new features now of what they call an advisory group, <laughs> Members of the DSB can now put, you know, get a, a group of advisory persons to reflect yeah. on interpretations and come up with their own that would then be annexed in the analytical, what I thought it was it the analytical report. So it's actually, I don't, I'm, I, I'm curious about the standing of that, but these were the two things that really jumped out of me as kind of, as you say, creating more of a balance. Anything else uh, that struck uh, you as really rebalancing? To, to me, you're right to insist. I mean, the second part, I'm not a big fan of this advisory group. I mean, this is not a new idea, first of all. I mean, if you go back in time, when was it 2000, the Brookings Institution had this discussion between Jackson Hudick and Don Davies. Barfield had a couple of papers about these backdoor solutions. I think backdoor solutions give the wrong incentives because if I'm a judge and I know uh, how the membership feels on a particular issue. And if I want to be a repeat player, span many panelists want to be repeat players, I might be deciding cases in light of what the advisory group, because I'm not a big fan of backdoor solutions. I like very much the other stuff that they have before, accent on mediation and so on. This, I think, is... But this is exante. I mean, this is the kind of stuff I would like to see in the WTO, especially for some cases, like... Uh, I don't think national security should be going to, to panels. I think national security should be going to a committee, for example, on national security. Something like what they have in mind in the beginning, mediation and so on. Uh, but I don't like very much the idea of backdoor solutions. I think it will give the wrong incentives to panelists. And and so I, I agree with you that maybe maybe they didn't get it exactly right, but the idea of equalizing between the judicial and the legislative function was important. But in the areas where they really try through this text to make the current proceedings more efficient, I know you're going to say what you think is missing, but I just want to play a little bit more with yeah. what is there, if you don't mind, if you would just yeah. uh, accommodate me. So one or two of the things I found really interesting are how they tried to make the panel proceedings more efficient. So things like, I found they spent a lot of time on these making a meaningful indicative list. So a lot of time on making sure that indicative lists can be more useful. Um, things like not blocking the panel establishment at the first meeting. How can third parties participate as adjudicators? And what I found, I don't know how you felt about this, the word limits and yeah. the time frames, word limits for normal cases and complex cases, like actually giving page numbers. Did you find that compelling? I think it's wrong, if you ask me. I would never do that. I, I think <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Uh, actually, you can even make the argument it puts into question the right of defense. I want to have a fair hearing. Let me speak as I want as I speak. Now I'm not denying that there are abuses. The word limit should be on panel reports, not on submissions. <laughs> this, this, I read now uh, one report that just finished the DS 600, 345 pages. Ah, uh, so they're each one, each one the issue. I mean, you ask yourself, how can it be? Hmm. How can it mm -hmm. be? Uh, uh, I'm I'm not a big fan of those. I mean, I don't think you should put quantitative limits. I think what they can, uh, you let parties do whatever they wish best, how to want, how to, whatever way they choose to defend their interests. And one thing I would do is I would ask all WTO panelists to read a few GATT reports 
and see how you can write exactly what they write in 500 pages and 20 and 30 pages. It used to right. be the case before. Right. I mean, that's interesting because for a lot of developing countries, they say they can't get into the system because they're so petrified that they have to get very, very sophisticated lawyers who can write hundreds of pages. And maybe this is an attempt to make it much simpler. But I, I actually find it interesting that you say, well, let's put the exercise, let's exercise the discipline on the adjudicators with the number of pages. I like that. But but did you see they did have um, guidelines for adjudicators in uh, tit Title V? So yeah. they spell out the rules on interpretation, more rules on burden of proof, and it's in the case law. It seems to me to be reflected there. But things like just focusing on things necessary to resolve the dispute, focus on claims, no precedential value. We know the background for this. This is a nod to the United States for some of its criticisms. What did you think about these uh, new, very specific guidelines to I, I, adjudicate? I'll tell you the two areas where I'm most unhappy, not where I'm happy, okay. because where I'm happy, I don't have to just say I'm happy, it doesn't make Okay. Let me let let me let you speak. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I am unhappy from what all the things you mentioned now. No, I'm not going anywhere else. I'm sticking to what you ask. I don't think it makes sense to say no presidential value. I mean, to me, first of all, the U.S. doesn't mean it. The whole U.S. legal system is about precedent. I mean, the only reason why the U.S. mentioned precedent is because of zeroing. There is no other reason. And it doesn't make sense to say no precedent, even if there is no binding, like stare decisis. I mean, what kind of court will say black, white, and gray on the same issue and still be credible? None. The whole idea of a court is to be prepare its own demise. I mean, it's to make the marginal transaction predictable. This presupposes, of course, some sort of precedent. I mean, by definition. If there is a new theory, like we changed our idea about vertical restraints in antitrust, because in economics something developed, fine. But there should be an obligation, in my view, to look into past case law. And if you disagree, explain why you disagree. But you cannot pretend that past case law does not agree, as sometimes has happened, no, a few times, happened and by the appellate body and especially by panels. To me, this is crazy. The, the other point I didn't like very much is all these things, I mean, these very detailed guidelines about how to deal with the burden of proof. To me, this is the wrong target because no matter what you say, no matter what you write in this respect, at the end of the day, the, the facts are quite simple. The WTO judge has in front of her or in front of him two incomplete contracts, the WTO and the Vienna Convention. We cannot specify them. There is nothing like a coefficient of importance of the Vienna Convention elements. And you cannot, no matter what you write, you cannot do that. It doesn't exist. So what matters is not how the, the guidelines you write, but the quality of the people you appoint. And I'm not very happy with the quality of the people I see appointed, especially and both in panels and the appellate body, I must say. I'm not very happy. I think they should take it a little bit more seriously. And you're not happy with... So, so I love your honesty. But are you you're not happy with the the new uh, focus on things like gender balance and diversity in the selection of persons on that indicative list? There's also an option for people to volunteer to be on these lists, which I found interesting. Instead of waiting to be called, you can volunteer. So these are the attempts to make the panel selection process and a panel with a quality of panelists sort of a higher quality. The question is. Did they get it right? And then the second thing that I, I wanted to ask you is there's also this huge focus on the secretariat report of support. So really interesting, having worked at the appellate body, that some of the things they say is the appellate body basically has to write and draft its own conclusions. And I don't know how that's going to be monitored, quite frankly, um, but there seems to be a concern that there is not enough, let's say, in interference by the adjudicators themselves or engagement in the drafting and decision making. It isn't specified, but isn't that what it's getting at in that? In maybe kind of maybe you're. I, th I think you're right. I think your reading is right. But to me, again, they're looking to the wrong. It's the wrong target. 
I don't like the idea of two things I don't like about panels. Let's forget the apple at body for a moment. I don't like the fact that you don't have permanent. I would have had permanent panelists, honestly. I would pick 25 people and keep them six years or eight years, one mandate, and then they go home, no reappointment. I don't like the idea of appointing different people for every panel. How on earth can you expect from delegates? I mean, just if we want to be intellectually honest, to commit and learn about the huge body of WTO law when they might be only once acting as panelists. And I don't like the idea of the Secretariat proposing. I have to be perfectly frank with you. The Secretariat has its own agenda. I don't think the Secretariat is totally innocent, the honest broker, no. I think members should be, uh, the principals should take responsibility and they should appoint 25, 20, 25 permanent panelists. I would never, I, I don't, I don't look at the, when I, when you look at the gut, I, when I finished my book on dispute settlement, one of the things I did was I was looking into the, 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 the I did some typecasting of the average, average gut panelist and the average WTO panelist. It's day and night. I mean, when you look into the gut uh, reports, you see consistently either high level amb ambassadors and so on from the insiders, but also many very reputed academics. Now, the only reputed academic I see a few times, not very often, is my dear friend Bill David. And not as frequently as I would like to see him. What I see consistently is first appointment in Geneva acting as panelists. And you act guys who never took a class on WTO to decide on how to use, how does causality work in anti-dumping where 50 different factors affect an outcome? Seriously? But on that, Petros, let me just push back a little bit because I think the system does need to evolve and be more, more diverse. So for instance, I've served now as a panelist once, twice, uh, and biologic persons like myself may not ever get in because you know, we we have some background, but we're not seasoned panelists. And I think the system does need to evolve so that it's reflective of its membership. One of the things that I saw is that there should be a focus on legal pra practitioners. Again, I haven't studied it in the minutia of detail, but, but I did see some attempts to bring in practitioners, not necessarily negotiators, but practitioners. But let me, I know we don't have a lot of time. Let me just ask, let me roll up my three last questions for you on the substantive proposals in one. And that is, you keep saying that you think that, or at least I'm hearing you say that the focus of these reform um, proposals seems to not hit the mark, right? Like for me, what I was hoping to see was more on getting more participation and accessible uh, options for developing countries. There is Title IX that has things like more regional training programs, um, increase the number of persons like yourself who can offer advice. But I was hoping for something more meaningful. I mean, maybe with greater uh, options for ADR, you get more developing countries participating. But I, I thought compliance also, what is the real innovation there? What I see is compliance being something that is now you, you can go to ADR <laughs> to get compliance. But on the big issues of the unevenness, for instance, for developing countries to retaliate. I didn't see anything there. And then the final thing is, there's this new accountability uh, mechanism that's sort of like a KPI, like key performance, <laughs> a key performance assessment that the chair of the DSB will kind of see how the reform package is being implemented every two years. So on these three things, I know I'm giving you a lot to consider, but any what what are your what are your impressions on are these really the things we expected on reform coming well, out? Uh, well, it, it depends. Everyone has uh, his or her agenda on uh, on reform. To me, uh, to me, the key point is uh, what I mentioned before: the quality of the judges. I mean, this is number one for me, uh, precisely because these are agents with substantial discretion, who you appoint matters, and it matters a lot. Uh, we've, I have witnessed, in my view, for whatever my view is worth, huge errors by not only panels, by the appellate body, huge errors. I mean, when I try to teach my kids what is non-discrimination, how on earth do you teach it in light of the appellate body case? How can you discuss seriously 
uh, national treatment looking at the apple at body case law when in one case in the um, uh, TBT case they said two products with cross price elasticity at 0.06 have high are in, are in very intense competition I mean it's crazy and nobody says a word I mean actually many people do but they're called academics the majority of people the, the delegates they keep their mouth shut to be nice uh, uh, to the people in Geneva and eventually get their own reappointments and stuff to me, this is the number one where I would be. The second point that you made, which I totally agree, is if I'm, if I'm a developing country, why should I go to the WTO? Because if it is against the EU, US, China, I know exactly that even if I win, they can afford to disregard totally the decision. And uh, I was implicated a little bit in the Ecuador case in bananas, and I saw it, I lived it firsthand. Uh, these guys, they have no hope. No hope. Ecuador had to wait for 30 years before the EU finally would do what it did in 2014. And 30 years, they lost money and a lot of money. Not money, a lot of money. So what do you do about those guys? I mean, there are proposals. Out. I mean, this guy, Hoka Nordstrom, the Swedish economist, had this very nice paper where he was saying, look, I mean, one way to deal with those things would be to have small claims tribunals, finish the case faster and so on. Yes, I was looking I mean, for that. But none of these proposals found its way in the negotiations, ever. Which, to me, shows a little bit how serious they are about resolving them. Because it is not why it's year after year after year, they do nothing about these things. Uh, and finally, I mean, we, if, we, if we look at the process, if you think about it, I mean, people keep saying, oh, the Apple at body. Yeah, you have the Apple at body, and then you have... Comp uh, Compliance, compliance, Apple at body. I have to wait for five years to for what? If I'm the EU, the US, or China, I can sit back and wait. But if I'm Senegal or uh, I don't know Laos, can I wait for five years? Yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> and none I of mean, these things have been discussed. None of them. And and we have to expect that it, these were maybe the things that were were difficult, which is why I'm wondering if the approach was. Let's fix the things that we can. I'm, I'm thinking about the process. And that's why the appellate body could not be fixed yet. But let's kind of try to do the low-hanging fruit. Let's just think about what are the things we can do to make make it better with the huge, I think the huge innovation being how much they expanded the procedures for ADR. Because this was one Article 5 and now it's what? An entire title. And maybe that's the way they anticipate there'll be more cases for countries that are smaller through a non-adjudicative means and um, other other little innovations that will just make it easier. But maybe who knows if they got the balance right. But I know we're almost out of time um, and I want to leave you with the last word. So what now? I, I know you don't think it's going to, we know it's not going to end by 2024. It's an election year in a lot of countries. Um and we know that there may be a new chair to or a convener um, to drive the process. But from your perspective, what needs to happen now for any chance of success for the process to evolve? And I wish I had the magic wand. Uh, you know, I think, I think whatever will happen, it will be function of who wins in the U.S. elections and how this person will deal with China. Uh, if the U.S.-China story does not, one way or the other, get sorted out, I cannot. I don't expect meaningful change in dispute settlement in the WTO. If uh, the current standoff continues, I think realistically, the maximum we can expect is some court, some sort of ICJ type solution in the WTO, an optional clause. Those of us who want to sign it on reciprocity, they do, and those who don't, they don't. And you have a two-tier adjudication system. To go beyond that, I think the sine qua non is to find the solution between U.S. and China, which I don't see happening not before at least the elections. And then it will need a lot of work. That's a, that's a macro environment. But on this specific process, this one that has already started, this one that's contained in, I forgot the number of the decision. <laughs> this one that Marco uh, Molina started, what's going to happen with all these 43 pages? 
a number of a number of projects like this have seen the light of day and then they may remain projects i wouldn't be surprised if this remains a project as well honestly and if you ask me to bet my money now i would say it will be a project i will always compliment dr molina tejeda for his work but honestly i cannot see how uh, a number of countries can live with this project well thank you for that i hope it gets some uh some better outcome than that one. Oh, I hope I'm proved totally wrong if you ask me. You didn't ask me what I hope. You asked me what I think. I know. I know. What I hope. I hope we could turn the clock back. But this, I don't see how we can do it. I think I, I'm with you that I, I think it's very unlikely that you can take this process out of the broader politics of what's happening with the US and China and all these others and India and South Africa because but but the thing is that what I hope happens is that this begins a process for reform on the lower hanging fruit that maybe we can get some agreement on that this it's un, uncontrovertible that some of these things need to happen. Whether they got the balance right in there through these new 10 titles, how it's going to take effect, that's for another that's for another session. But thank you so much, Petros, Professor Pavarkis. And uh, I hope this was a great session for the FMG's series. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.